Yes. Now, I understand. Yes, I understand. Mr. Wade, I got a guy here says he was kidnapped by Martians. Said they took him home with him and they all went swimming in the canals. Says he's got pictures. Hmm. If that's the best we can do. Uh, hold. Uh, Mr. Wade, Mr. Wade, uh... There's still the Reverend Stafford's ex-chauffeur. Now, he swears that Stafford made three attempts on his wife's life, but he won't budge on his price. Pay it, Frank. You're the managing editor, not the accountant. It's only money. You know, paper clips. Oh, Michelle. How are you doing? Can I see you alone? That's an invitation I'll always accept. Look, I'm a little nervous about saying this, but I'd like to beg off the judge's story. Michelle, we went all through this. And last I agreed, week. I know. But the more of these I do, the queasier I feel. Nobody said it was pretty. A lot of what we do isn't pretty. Iran Gate wasn't pretty. Watergate wasn't pretty. For God's sake, Harlan, where's the comparison? What we're doing is sleaze. The hell it is. We provide a service, a kind of journalism that the people can't get anywhere else. Kicking hell out of commie-loving politicians, drugged-out actresses, doctors who suppress cancer cures. It's... it's our duty under the First Amendment. I've heard that song before, Harlan. It's just not playing right for me. Michelle. You're just tired. Burned out. Sort of goes with being a good reporter. I need your help, sweetheart. Those others out there... Glorified hacks. If I take you off the judge's story, I may as well forget it. I can't afford that. The paper can't afford it. Harlan, when I came here, you promised... I know what I promised. I'll stand by it. Then why haven't you answered my memos? I've sent you at least five on that chain of nursing homes. You get me what I want, and I'll give you what you want. You have my word, Michelle. I wish I could believe that. Believe it. Hit a home run, baby. I'm counting on you. And you know I know how to be grateful. Say a week in Bermuda, Hawaii, Cozumel, anywhere you want to go. On me, first class, with everything thrown in. Wonderful man. I'm having a medal struck in his honor. Save one for me. I don't believe it, Paul. Surprised, huh? Tell me you're thrilled, too. What on earth are you doing here? I'm working on a case with Perry, which gives us plenty of time to get reacquainted. Want to buy me some lunch? Paul, I am up to here with assignments. Honestly, I'm really jammed. Oh, sorry, this is Rick Connor, my partner in crime. Rick, hi. Well, um, you know, he looks pretty confident. Why don't you let him do a single today, huh? I'd love to, Paul, but I'm already late for an appointment. Okay, well, you leave me no choice. I'm going to come with you. I want you to wait right here. I'll be right back. Where is he going? Mr. Wade. Who are you? You remember me, Paul Drake. That's for you. What is this? It's a summons and complaint for libel. Compliments of Senator Langley. Have a nice day. Hey, you can't come. Oh, I was afraid we laid it on a little thick for that Langley feature. <laughs> Wouldn't you know the lawyer on this is Perry Mason? Mason? Frank, I want you to drop everything you're doing. Dig up what you can on Mason. If you can't find anything, invent it. The usual. So you consider yourself a good friend of Judge McGill. Isn't that right? Uh, well, yes. Uh, he said hello to me every morning. Uh... And knowing his lovely wife, you must have been shocked when he and that pretty, long-legged secretary of his came sneaking in here that night. Very shocked. Uh, yes, very shocked. 
And you never did see them come out, did you? She stayed here all night? I didn't see them come out, no. Excuse me. Judge Sanford McGill, in line for the state Supreme Court vacancy, has been having a secret love affair with his pretty long-legged secretary, a close friend confided. I was very shocked, the friend explained, when the two lovebirds slipped into a classy midtown hotel and didn't come out until morning. Who am I kidding? Not me. How about you? I wish I could. Why did you have to show up anyway? Did I advertise for a conscience? Does this mean that I have to pay for lunch? There you are. You're not dressed. The party starts at 2 o'clock. We're not going. Not going? You don't feel well. Oh, I'm feeling fine. You know where the Society for Homeless Children is holding the event this year? Yes, at the, uh, the Melbourne Estate. According to this, mm -hmm. it was recently purchased by Harlan Wade. Now you know why we're not going. You're on the Society's advisory board. We are not going. But... Not even for the children. If I can't get circulation up, the only thing we'll be publishing around here is our obituary. Huh. Nice of you folks to join us. Sorry we're late, Harlan. <sighs> What'd you get from the dorm? Nothing. He suddenly had an attack of conscience. Catches up to all of us sooner or later. That's too bad. But we'll get it. Just up the ante. Oh, you were supposed to see him at 10. It's 1.30 now. Where have you been all this time? Working on something else. The chain of nursing homes. Handled right, the story could get us a Pulitzer. If you saw what Rick and I did this morning, old people abandoned and dying, you'd know what I mean. Nursing homes. Old people. Okay, kid. Go win us a Pulitzer. Thanks, Harlan. You won't regret it. You'll see. Connor. I was wrong about her, Frank. Very wrong. I want her out of here today. Dr. and Mrs. Clayman. Still the most attractive couple in town. Glad you could come. General, you're not leaving already. My wife isn't feeling well. I thought we would go home early. Oh, I am sorry. Uh, I know this is a terrible imposition, sir, but I wonder if you could pose for just one picture with me. It isn't too often that I get the opportunity to be photographed with a great war hero. Well, another time. Oh, please, General, there may not be another time. Uh, I'd really appreciate it. Well, to be quite frank, Mr. Wade, I'd rather be photographed with a snake. What's with him? You. You see, the general came by here to help a good cause. Right? So why don't you just forget who he is? And while you're at it, call off that pack of wolves that call themselves reporters, because we don't need your kind of stories. Understand, Harlan? Yeah. <laughs> Great party. You would pull your gun at your own party? Ortega, what kind of way is that for a banker to behave? I was merely getting your attention, since you don't answer phone calls. Maybe I knew why you were calling. I am sure you do. It's about the smear you're planning with me as the target. What smear? I'm in the business of news, human interest. Then you should be more careful of your sources. Am I clear? Maybe we can talk later. When things get quiet, in the meantime, enjoy yourself. I intend to.
Next time, let's try to get a few friends here. Who? No, thank you. Oh, thank you. You don't care for any? I'm here because I promised. I said nothing about having a good time. Jason, I'm Harlan Wade. Is that so? We've never met, but I recognize you from your pictures. You must be Ms. Street. Thank you, yes. How do you do? Would you excuse us a minute for a little business talk? Mr. Wade, I'm not going to discuss the lawsuit. I think you'll recall dates and places. You and Miss Street. Very inventive. But I can get bellmen, maids, hotel staff, others who will swear to occasions when you and Miss Street stayed together at the same hotel. How shocked they were by your behavior. To buy all that, you must have a very large editorial budget. Largest in the world. Mr. Wade. I'd save your money for your attorney's fees. Young lady, I think we've enjoyed this extraordinary event long enough. Mr. Wade? Doorman will get it. Paul, I told you. I've got at least three hours at the word processor to get this story out. Wade is never going to print your story. Yes, he will. He has to. The only way I'm ever going to get off the informer is to make a name for myself. This is my shot. Good luck. If I make it before midnight, is that all right? If you make it before breakfast, it's all right. Any coffee left, Rick? I've got a ton of work. Michelle, I tried to find you, warn you, but I didn't know. Did Wade say where I was supposed to pick up my check? Look, Michelle, getting canned isn't the end of the world. Why don't we go out for a drink, get you calmed down? You know something, Rick? For a second, you sounded just like him. Don't. You're a good guy, and he's a vicious, sadistic hypocrite. Michelle, where are you going? To show Wade what I think of him. He's not getting away with this. Everything okay out here? Yeah. All right, all right. Hey, you're doing good. I'm going to go back in the house. Yeah. Don't shoot, Harlan. You could spoil a lovely evening. I used your bathroom to freshen up. I hope you don't mind. What do you want? Harlan, I need your help. You want me to kill the story behind your divorce, don't you? Oh, I'd be very grateful. You really think I'd give up that story for anything you've got to offer? Good night, Marianne. Great security, Moretti. Sorry, Mr. Wade. She must have. She must yeah, have. Yeah, she must have. Why don't you get me a pair of trunks and take a swim? Sorry, Miss Benty. Mr. Wade's in the pool. Strict instructions. No more visitors. Tell Mr. Wade I don't give a damn about his instructions. Mr. Moretti, this is Matthews. Yeah, Moretti. Yeah, right. Mr. Wade, Shell Bindi's on her way in. D. 
the cleanup crew should be done with the party now. I'm going to go secure the place. You have three minutes to say anything you want to. After that, I expect to hear good night, thanks for the memories, and I'll see you around. Oh, no, it's not that easy. You lied to me. You're young, Michelle. Really naive. You knew what my paper was like when you came to work here. I gotta hand it to you, Wade. You did one smooth con job on me. It wasn't all con. I liked you, kid. You've been a little nicer to me. Who knows, I might have given you anything you wanted. Wade, you really are a sleaze. I'm only sorry I didn't see it sooner. Careful, baby. You could fall on your face. I know I was speeding. 70 in a 55 zone. May I see your license, please? car, please. Why? I'm afraid you'll have to come with me, ma'am. What's wrong? There's been a murder. You're wanted for questioning. What's going to happen to the lawsuit now that Wade is dead? Well, if the new management agrees to print retractions, we'll drop the suit. Morning, Paul. Good morning. You get to see Michelle. Yes. How's she holding up? She's feeling a lot better. Well, the Perry's going to see her. Who do you think uh, might have killed Wade? I think we could fill a football stadium with suspects. Why do you think they're so convinced that Michelle did it? The party was over. Everyone had gone home. Mm -hmm. Michelle was left alone with him. Then he was found dead. When the police finally caught up with her, she was speeding away from the scene, so... There was one other thing. What's that? Her fingerprints were on the murder weapon. It must have happened when I was leaving. I slipped and grabbed the statue to keep from falling. Mr. Mason, are they sure that's what was used to kill him? I've just gone over the police report. Wade was found floating in his pool. Fragments of the statue were found in his skull. It just doesn't make sense, the thought of me wanting to kill Wade. The prosecution's going to make a compelling case. Wade fired you. You were furious. You fought. He wouldn't relent. You lost control, grabbed the nearest handy object, and kept hitting him till he was dead. I didn't do it. Of course you didn't do it. morning. Uh, I should have expected to see you here, but it's always something of a surprise. A pleasant one, I hope. Of course. Your Honor, this was not a death resulting from reckless conduct or even voluntary manslaughter. The people allege 
that this was a murder of premeditation and deliberation by this defendant, we respectfully request that bail be denied. Your Honor, I've known Michelle Bente for almost two years, and I can assure the court she is a responsible young woman with substantial ties to the community. She is a professional journalist who... Journalist? Your Honor, this young woman is a procurer of libelous misstatements and innuendos for a weekly tabloid that mocks the First Amendment while it pads its corporate wallet. We're all spread... acquainted with the confidential informer. I would remind my distinguished colleague, it is my client, not this journal, who is the accused here. Miss Bente denies any involvement with this death and is looking forward to her day in court. The court is granting bail in this case in the amount of $200,000. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, Wade was sitting here at the edge of the pool. She grabbed the statue. Someone grabbed the statue. And when Wade turned his head, she smashed his skull in. I should have never left him alone with her, not the mood she was in. Mr. Moretti, from the time Ms. Bente left the estate to when you discovered the body, how much time had elapsed? Minutes. Three, four max. Wait a minute. If you're saying somebody else had a chance to do it, impossible. It wasn't time. Besides, nobody could have got off this state. Everything was buttoned down tight. Nobody in, nobody out. You're positive. I'm paid to be positive. Anything else, Mr. Mason? I understand Mr. Wade always carried a gun wherever he went. That's right. Did he have it with him at the time he was murdered? I saw him put it in the pocket of his robe just before he came down for his swim. Then he put the robe over there on that chair. Lieutenant, there's no mention of the gun in the police report. Well, no gun was found. Then it is missing. Well, which point, Mr. Mason? Well, it wasn't found on Ms. Bente when she was arrested. This estate is certainly well guarded. I wonder how it could have disappeared. She must have taken it with her and uh, dumped it along the road. Why would she take it, Lieutenant? The gun wasn't the murder weapon. How should I know? How oh, indeed. Thank you both for your cooperation. Well, what about letters? Did Wade receive any actual death threats? Just your run-of-the-mill hate mail. Let's face it, anybody who's been the subject of one of Wade's smear jobs would love to see him dead. What about, uh, like, a story that might have still been in progress? Kill Wade before it's even published? Yeah, maybe. In an attempt to keep the story from getting to print, it's a lot stronger motivation than revenge after the fact. You know, that makes a lot of sense. I think it does, too. Except most of what Wade publishes is just rumor, innuendo. Well, maybe he had something a little bit more concrete this time. What were some of the stories he was working on? All sorts of things. I've got notes on all of them at the office. Uh, notes. What about uh, Wade's file? <laughs> Wade keeps all the juicy stuff and evidence locked in his safe. You have a combination? Uh-uh. Hmm. Well, let's go get your notes. I think I'd better get dressed first. <laughs> Michelle, let me ask you something. If this guy was such a lowlife, why'd you end up working for him? Best job I could get. Why? This condo, car, half a dozen credit cards that go along with it? Yeah, it's part of the trap. But you know, reporters at the Informer make three, four times the going rate of other papers, plus all this. You start out working there thinking you'll just put aside a little nest egg and then leave to do something important. But you get real used to those big bucks. Guess I don't have to worry about that anymore. No, not anymore. Paul, it's not locked. Here. 
camino. the simplest explanation is that there was information that was incriminating so it had to be extracted before it fell into the wrong hands if that's true why take all four files you're sure only four are missing positive wade kept them together in a special folder the hot file he called it when i checked the safe after the break and it was gone and with it all the evidence wade had dug up on general Sorensen. Oscar Ortega and the doctor and Mrs. Clayman. There's information on all four of them in my notes. Philip, are those four on the guest list? Yes. They all seem to have been at the party. All right, I'll check them out. Your breakfast yet? Yes, I did. And you're still here? Paul, we need that safe cracker. Right away. Michelle, if you're up to it, would you help me, please? Let's go. You really love to get on his case. <laughs> yes, I guess I do. You want me to type up those notes? As soon as I've checked them through. Yes. Miss Street, these are for you. Where would you like me to set them? Oh, right over there. That's okay. The tip's been taken care of. Have a good day. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Strange. Ever see a bellhop that won't accept a tip? Maybe he's independently wealthy. Who are they from? Uh, they're uh, from the hotel. I guess when you take an expensive suite, you get an expensive welcome. Actually, looks good for a green horse. It's my day off. I'm hungover, so if you want another screaming session, try primal therapy. I won't take long, but I'm in a little jam. I'm deeply moved. Jack, I need some money. You've frozen our account. Your and... next check will be on time, Thursday a week, just as the agreement says. 30,000, Jack. I need 30,000. Temporary alimony isn't going to cover that. 30,000 for what? I can't say. You're being blackmailed, aren't you? How would you know that? 
Unless you're being blackmailed, too, aren't you? You're getting off easy. I'm supposed to cough up a... Excuse me, may I help you? Sorry if I'm intruding, doctor. I'm Michelle Venti's attorney. My name's Mason. Well, I'm sorry for her. She deserves a medal. Unfortunately, I'm afraid that's all the help I can give her. I take it you had a problem with Harlan Wade. And since you're here, Mr. Mason, you already know that. And you already know we were both at the party the day he was killed. Care for a beer? No, thank you. I hate to rush you, Mr. Mason, but my husband and I were going over some important business. So if there's something you'd like to know, please ask it and then go. I understand from the police report you left Wade's party so quickly nobody seems to have seen you leave. I left early. I was bored to tears. If necessary, a friend will confirm that I was home tucking my son in bed when the happy event occurred. Friend? That's right. Bobby Conwell. Oh, yes. Bobby Conwell. Wasn't he one of the reasons for your pending divorce from Dr. Clayman? Who told you that? Wade had reporters researching rumors about both of you. Stay away from me, Mr. Mason. Far away. Oh, uh, Jack. What we discussed before, I need it today. Or I swear it'll take more than a court order for you to visit your son again. Gonna be one hell of a divorce, Mason. But she'll go down like the Titanic. I've got enough on her to get custody of my son and to leave her scrounging for nickels. I'm betting on a draw. Doctor, just where were you when... I was here, getting plastered, feeling sorry for myself. Alone? Of course. Of course. He's not there. You think he'd be at the park? Thanks. I'll try him there. Grab that. I'll take this. We're out of here. Well, well, look who's here. I'm just getting my things, Frank. No, no, I'm glad you came by. Look, Michelle, uh, how much you want for your story? Rick, uh, get up here and get some pictures, will you? Now, it's got to be an exclusive now, because I don't want you talking to anybody else. Frank, that's the sickest thing I've ever heard. And I've heard a lot around here. Yeah, well, why? I mean, somebody's going to do the story. It might as well be us. Huh? Sounds like Harlan Wade's philosophy. Come on, let's go. You're going to regret this. You're going to regret this. Why don't you back off? Come on, you, you, you got a camera. Will you use it? Mr. Mason. May I sit down? You must have made quite an impression on my secretary to find me here. I told her it was a matter of life and death. <laughs> my life? Wade's death. I mean, it is Wade we're talking about. That's right. And I am a suspect. Now, why would I want to kill my friend Wade? I understand he had his people working on a rumor about your bank being in the money laundering business that its top clients are drug dealers? That's a lie. Is it? For the sophisticated men, you're very gullible, Mason. Maybe what Wade had in his safe was proof of your bank's dealings. Maybe Wade was killed to stop him from exposing you. What the hell is this about a safe? It's in the late edition, Mr. Ortega. Somebody broke into Wade's safe and took a number of files, yours among them. Why would I go to the trouble of stealing my own file so that I could blackmail myself? That's right. Whoever got into that safe called me an hour ago. He told me he had information that could destroy me and my bank. He wanted a hundred thousand for it. And? I don't pay blackmail, Mr. Mason. For a lot less than a hundred thousand, I can hire a specialist to deal with the situation more permanently. Now, if you'll excuse me, I like to be at the bank before it closes. Stunning maneuver, Pasquale. Very first rate, but. Checkmate, I'm afraid. 
<laughs> My dear Michelle, you're free again. Only on bail. I want you to meet a good friend. Paul Drake, How do you do? Cyril How do you do? Cyril's been very helpful to some of the reporters on the paper. I'm a marvelous character witness. My credentials are impeccable. My record is spotless. And he'll testify to anything for a price. That's right. What have you for me today? I need some information. Michelle tells me that you know everything that goes on in the city. Something tells me we're going to talk about the underworld. Cyril, it's important. Last night, I had a run-in with a safecracker. Wide shoulders, uh, chains on the wrist, around the neck. He's very good at his job. Do you have any ideas who it might be? Yes, he's so boring. He's also very dangerous. If I were you, I'd stay very wide of him. Well, I need his name. Would you believe he's called Animal? Where can we find him? He usually frequents the Three Aces. Probably still does. Thanks, Cyril. I owe you one. Be extremely careful. This animal's no pussycat. He likes to hurt people. We've met. Thank you. Where do you suppose I can find a cab right now? Meaning go home like a good little girl because Cyril says he's dangerous? <laughs> Paul, I can handle myself. I'm sure you can. You know what? I think I'm going to rent a car. Paul, you're not going to find a rental car around here. Use mine. I'll get a cab. You sure? Yeah, I'm sure. All right. It saves me some time. I'll call you when I have something. Go home. <laughs> Impressive, General. They're weekend soldiers. They're running fast. They'll be very effective. In whose army? It's hard to say. But they probably wind up in Central America. Have you been doing this long? No, both Captain Rivers and myself are retired. We're volunteers, that's all. Fills in some long hours and some very long days. You don't sound like a man who's ready for retirement. Far from it. Mr. Mason, what brings you here? Some files concerning you were stolen from Harlan Wade's safe last night. You're certainly not suggesting that I took them. I'm suggesting that you're being blackmailed. Don't dance with me, Mr. Mason. I don't like cute politicians and clever lawyers. You're implying that I had something to do with Wade's death. Well, I didn't. I went directly home from that party, saw my wife to bed, and fell asleep in the den watching TV. Would you be able to prove that? Unfortunately, no. I didn't think I'd have to have an alibi for a murder I had no motive to commit. I can think of one. Isn't it true you were about to be appointed to the board of directors of the South Wing Corporation? How'd you find out about that? What's important is Wade found out about it. And a scandal involving you that went all the way back to Vietnam. Sir, do we have to listen to this? No. Mr. Mason, I just overstayed his welcome. I enjoyed every minute of it. What's the matter with you? This is a restricted area. Did you see the warning sign back there? If there had been a sign, General, my driver and I surely would have seen it. You and I both know that. 
See what the hell happened to it. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for the ride. I enjoyed every minute of it. Well, what do you think? <laughs> Just great, Della. Especially this one on Dr. Clayman. Where'd you get it? A Jerry Stringer from Kansas City. He came uh -huh. up with it. Would you like it poured now, or shall oh. we let it chill for a few minutes more? I'm so sorry. Uh, we didn't order that. It must be some mistake. Well, it was ordered for you, Miss Street. Uh, by whom? Well, I wasn't given a name. Well, uh, just leave it right there and come back in a little bit, would you please? Maybe he's married. Or maybe he's uh, just shy. <clears throat> Must be some mistake. Well, work on it later. Right now, I need you to check on the caterer, all the temporary help at Wade's party. I want their precise schedules, what they did, when they left, and... Unless you've made some plans I know nothing about. Never. Never? Hardly ever. you money <clears throat> and mess me up see uh, i got a job i was talking to your friends and they were telling me that you're the best i ain't got no friends now come on animal i mean uh, mr randall you mind if i call you that now we are talking about <clears throat> big money here not the kind of money you made last night i don't know what you're talking about mister well Come on now, he laid the whole thing out for me. Said you pulled it off nice and clean. That's why I gotta have you working for me. I got to. You laid what out? Come on, Mr. Animal. You got a short memory. <laughs> you know what I think? I think you're fishing. I think I know you. Maybe you ought to get your face out of mine before I break yours. What are you doing here? You didn't really think I'd go home, did you? Here, I brought you some coffee. Lack of sugar, right? Yes. I did think you'd go home. And no, I don't like sugar in my coffee. I'm surprised you forgot. Actually, I just guessed. Where is he? Right there. Well, Doctor, you're a fine artist. Thank you. What's on your mind, Mason? You told me you were on your ranch at the time Wade was murdered. That's right. Your answering service called you there three times during that evening. One of them was an emergency you never picked up. Maybe I was in the shower or asleep. You can do better than that, doctor. All right. I was at a singles bar, trying to find a girl, any girl. I was lonely, drunk, but I went back to the ranch alone. Why are you picking on me, Mason? Do you really think I killed Wade just to keep my divorce out of his scandal sheet? No. 
But you did have something much more damaging to hide. What are you talking about? A young doctor, much older and very rich wife, suddenly and mysteriously dies. Self-administered overdose of insulin. Kansas City, 1967. You were almost indicted. Finally, the district attorney dropped the whole thing, insufficient evidence. You inherited $2 million, moved here. If Wade printed the Kansas story along with your present divorce, you would have been ruined. I didn't kill him, Mason. No one that I know of has said that you did, Dr. Clayman. No one. Stay here. Go pay him a visit. I always wondered how Rick could afford this place. Maybe he couldn't. That's why he's moonlighting. He hired the animal? He's our blackmailer? This is his place. Wait a minute. Looks like somebody beat us here. not been a good day. Paul, relax, he'll show. Before or after I'm deaf. If he's alive, he'll be here. This is his second home. Another drink? I don't think so. You know, I never really did thank you for getting Kermit to take my case. There's no time like the present. Get out of here, Doug. I mean it. One of your former associates? Now I know what it feels like to be fair game. Oh, no. That look familiar? Your partner's here. Come on. Be there.
Go get help. Come on. Lieutenant Donahue, referring to the report which you're holding in your hand, which is marked People's Exhibit H, what was the cause of death? The uh, victim died of a massive cerebral hemorrhage resulting from one or more blows uh, by a blunt object to the base of the skull approximately here. This piece of carved marble, which is marked People's Exhibit A, do you recognize it? Yes, I do. What is it, and where was it found? Well, that portion of the statue was found at the bottom of the pool underneath the victim, and uh, those portions were found on the deck nearby. Could this have been the murder weapon? Yes, the um, fragments from the statue were found in the wound on the uh, victim's head, and, of course, the... Uh, Portions that you see there were found uh, close by the decedent's body. Now, the statue is weighty, but it's not terribly heavy. Tell me, could a woman lift it, do you think? Objection. No foundation in proper opinion. Sustained. Uh, Lieutenant, one last question. Fingerprints were found on the smooth portion of the statue. Were those identified? Yes, they match those of the defendant. Thank you, Lieutenant. No further questions. Mr. Mason? Uh, Lieutenant Donahue. Lieutenant Donahue, the medical examiner's report also indicates the presence of several other deep bruises to the back of Mr. Wade's neck. Is that correct? Yes, it is. So it's possible that the killer inflicted additional blows to Mr. Wade's head either before or after the one that caused his death. Well, I suppose... The Objection calls for conclusion on the part of the witness. We'll draw the question. Lieutenant... The defense has learned that Mr. Wade carried a gun with him at all times. Does this agree with your findings? Yes, we have uh, statements to that effect. Huh? Isn't it true that Mr. Wade had the gun with him in his robe pocket when he went down to the pool? Uh, according to Mr. Moretti, it uh, is all of my report there. Now, when I first entered this case, I asked you if you'd found that gun. Now, I'll ask you once again. Have you found it? Uh, no, sir. The, since the gun had no bearing on the crime one way or the other, and assuming that the defendant took it with her and disposed of it... That's all. That's all. Mr. Moretti, is the woman you admitted to the estate that night present in the court? Yes, she is. Would you point her out, please? That's her right there indicating the defendant. Now, uh, Mr. Moretti, were you with Mr. Wade when the defendant arrived at the house? Yes, I was. Was that before or after the party had ended? It was a long time after the party ended. Was Ms. Benty expected? <laughs> Are you kidding? Mr. Wade had just fired her that afternoon. So... The three of you were alone by the pool. And then you left... To secure the estate. Leaving the defendant alone with her former employer, the man who had fired her that very afternoon. Objection. Argument. Sustained. Strike Mr. Esna's statement. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Moretti. How did Miss Benty appear to you? How did she seem? Uh, angry? Uh, upset? Objection. Improper opinion. All right, I will withdraw the question. 
Uh, Mr. Moretti, only a few more uh, questions, but they are vital ones. Did you see Ms. Benty leave the estate that night? Yes, I did. How did she leave? She left very fast. She peeled rubber going down the driveway. W uh, when was that? It was when I was walking back to the pool. Right before I found Mr. Wade floating in the pool. Now, how much time would you say actually elapsed from the time you saw Ms. Benty leave the estate until the time you discovered Mr. Wade's body? Two, three minutes, Max. Two to three minutes. Mr. Moretti, could anyone else have left the estate after Ms. Benty drove off? Absolutely not. Not unless they could fly. I secured the gates personally after she left. So let me tell you something, pal. The beating you took oh, last night on. is nothing come compared on. with what's coming up. Look, I wasn't black enough, so why did you right? give me a break? We're going to be hanging coats off your nose in a minute. I'm trying to help you. You know, you're not the world's most popular guy these days. You know that? It's up to you. Okay. Okay. I was in hock up to my neck. When I found out about the stories we were doing, I saw a chance to bail out. So when Wade got killed, I hired the animal. I got my hands on the files. All it took was a couple of phone the calls. Files, Connor. Make them public knowledge in your home free. From the cops, too. So you, you give them Mr. Animal and you make a deal. Come on. Files are in my locker. Spartan Athletic Club. These guys that made your face so pretty last night, you recognize them. Who sent them? Sure. I took pleasure in having it done. The only thing I regret is that my people are screwed up. I wanted the file on me. The one the blackmailer had. All I bought was trouble. Lately, I seem to be paying too much for too little. Meaning what? Wade owed a lot of money. He had thousands of promissory notes floating around town. I bought them all up at a premium. So, if he printed any scandal about you, you could have thrown him right into bankruptcy. You got it. He and I made a deal at his party. His silence for his solvency. You see, Mason, all you can do is nail me for turning a two-bit blackmailer inside out. But as for murdering Wade, why would I want to do that? I had him in my pocket. Of course, you can prove all that. Photocopies of Wade's promissory notes. The originals are in my safe. You want to save that girl, Mason? You're gonna have to find another Patsy. What's up? Mm. Coffee? No, thanks. I had it in the shower. Sorry about that. What happened? You find Wade's missing gun? I'd like you to find a Lieutenant Colonel Stanton McCauley retired as soon as you can. He lives somewhere in this area. How does he fit in? He served with General Sorensen in Vietnam. He was one of the junior officers who investigated the general on some rather serious charges. Find out if McCauley thinks any of it's true. It's all here. Hi. Hi. Thought you wanted to get some rest. I was going to until I saw this. This hits the newsstands tomorrow morning. Whoa, 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 whoa. 
I don't remember kissing you. Welcome to Harlan Wade's photo retouch lab. You might also notice that my neckline has dropped about two or three sexy inches. Wait till my mother sees this. Don't tell me your mother reads the confidential informer. Are you kidding me? She wouldn't miss it. You want to get some dinner? This doesn't bother you? Not if it doesn't bother Paul's mother. <laughs> Come on, let's make some more headlines. Miss Street? Right through there. Excuse me, um, this just arrived for you. For me? Oh, that, that won't be necessary. The tip's been taken care of. Thanks. Well, open it. Perfume? Four hundred dollars worth. Sounds serious. I just don't understand what's going on. You know the flowers that were sent the other day? They weren't from the hotel. And, and then the, the champagne, and then this. Who's sending these to me? What does the card say? From an admirer. Well, you've done it again. Mr. Moretti, yesterday you testified that on the night of the murder, nobody could have left the estate after Miss Bente did. In fact, she was the last one out. Is that still your testimony? Yes, it is. But... You're not positive, are you? I believe I told you once before, Mr. Mason, I'm paid to be positive. Yes, you did. But you told the police you saw Mrs. Clayman in Mr. Wade's house long after the other guests had gone home. She was there, all right. I saw her come running out of his bedroom just before he went and took his final swim. You didn't see her leave the estate, did you? No. Now, would you look at that young blonde lady seated in the second row? Miss Henderson, please stand. You recognize her, do you not? Yeah, I know her. Wasn't she one of the cocktail waitresses employed by the catering service at the party? Yeah, I believe she was. And she left with the catering van after Miss Benty did? No. Well, maybe. Maybe, maybe she did. Mr. Moretti, you testified earlier that from the time Miss Benty left to the time you discovered the body, only two to three minutes had elapsed. Yeah, that's pretty close to the time. But you're paid to be positive. Isn't it true you delayed the catering van's departure at least eight to ten minutes while you tried to um, hustle Miss Henderson's telephone number from her? Eight to ten minutes? Excuse me, but it's never taken me eight to ten minutes to get any girl's phone number. <laughs> eight to ten minutes, Mr. Moretti. The gate guard, the van driver, and Miss Henderson will all testify. Maybe it might have been a little longer. It was a little longer. Uh, thank you, Miss Henderson. Mr. Moretti, if I now understand your testimony correctly, it is entirely possible that someone hiding in the house could have gone down to the pool, waited for Miss Bente to leave, killed Mr. Wade, and then fled the estate. Objection, Your Honor, calls for speculation. I calls... have no further questions, Your Honor. Yeah, I drive that old van. Logan caters. Uses me a lot. How many people did you drive out to the Wade party, Mr. Forbes? Uh, eight, but I didn't know any of them, though. You're sure it was eight? 
Now, there's one thing I can do, and I can do good. I can drive, and I can count. And when I said that there was eight people penciling on that, that uh, what you call that roster thing, that's precisely how many there was, and that is precisely how many I took. When you left the Wade estate, Mr. Forbes, after the party was over, was your van full? He ain't had an empty seat in the house. <laughs> how many passengers does your van carry? Carries. Let's see now. Let me figure this out. It's, it's got nine seats plus mine. So, nine. In other words, Mr. Forbes, you brought eight people out to the party, but took nine back to town. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's right. You, you're pretty good. <laughs> now, you're not trying to say that I helped no murderer escape. No, Mr. Forbes, it's just simple arithmetic. I've no further questions. Mr. Reston? Nothing, Your Honor. You may step down. Oh, defense calls Marion Clayman to the stand. Mrs. Clayman, you've heard testimony to the effect. What I've heard is beneath contempt. May I finish my question? I'll finish it for you. Yes, I stayed behind and waited for Wade after the party was over. And yes, I was in his bedroom with him just before Mr. Moretti saw me leave. But no, I did not kill him. Thank you. Mrs. Clayman, you will please restrain yourself from doing anything more than answering counsel's questions. Is that understood? Your Honor, what Mr. Mason is about to do is to smear me with innuendos about why I was in Mr. Wade's bedroom, you my past not relationship with him. To anticipate counsel's questions, nor speculate on what he may be going to do. You will simply wait for counsel's question and respond. Is that clear? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. You may continue, Mr. Mason. Mrs. Clayman. Weren't you waiting in Mr. Wade's bedroom in order to persuade him not to publish a story about your impending divorce? I guess so. In fact, you didn't want him to publish anything in any way that touched on the divorce. Isn't that true? Oh, what's the use? No, I didn't want him to go within a million miles of it. How did you plan to persuade him not to publish that story? I offered to do whatever he wanted if he'd keep it out of his lousy paper. And did you? Objection, Your Honor. There is no relevancy here. Mr. Mason is harassing the witness. Your Honor, I am attempting to prove that my client wasn't the only one with the opportunity and the motive to kill. Sustained. I'll not allow the question. No. It seemed he preferred to take a cold swim. Mrs. Clayman, you are not to answer questions to which I have already sustained objections. The answer will be stricken. You may continue, Mr. Mason. You were married before your marriage to Dr. Clayman, were you not? That was a long time ago. I was just a kid. Back in Texas, wasn't it? Yes. Isn't it true you never divorced? And you knew you weren't divorced when you married Dr. Clayman? No. Mrs. Clayman, isn't it true that Harlan Wade discovered all of this and threatened to publish his discoveries? Thus making your marriage to Dr. Clayman a nullity, depriving you of support and community property? Mrs. Clayman? Look, I knew that Wade had found out, and that if he published the story, I'd be finished, ruined. But I didn't kill him. Didn't you? Mr. Moretti testified that he did not see you actually leave the estate. No one else did either. Objection, Your Honor. Mrs. Clayman is not on trial here. Mr. Mason is argumentative. Your Honor, I'm merely attempting to establish that my client might not have been the last person to leave, that in fact, Mrs. Clayman 
could have been the ninth person in the band. I'm sustaining, Mr. Mason. Mrs. Clayman, you're acquainted with Miss Hillary Scott? Yes, she babysits my children. Isn't it true you had to pay Miss Scott overtime because it was nearly midnight when you returned from the party? Where were you all that time? Objection. No relevancy. Mr. Mason is harassing and humiliating this witness. Order. Order. Mr. Mason, I have been tolerant up to now, but this concludes this line of questioning. Yes, it does. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions. Did she do it? What do you think? No. No. General, would you describe yourself as a man of action? I would describe myself as a former soldier who's seen combat, great deal of combat. Fought in two wars. And you've killed. I was an airborne rager, Mr. Mason, not a pastry chef. Meaning you have killed? Yes. Have you ever killed with your bare hands? Objection. Relevancy. It would appear that Mr. Mason is attempting to put the entire state on trial for murder in the bizarre hope of distracting this court from the real issue, the guilt or innocence of Michelle Benty. Your Honor, my sole purpose is to deal with the real issue by proving to this court that my client is innocent. You may proceed, Mr. Mason. When you did kill, General, how did you regard your enemy? As an enemy. Is that how you felt about Harlan Wade? That he was an enemy to be hated and feared? I wouldn't say feared. You didn't fear him? Even though he was going to publish articles purporting to prove that while serving in Vietnam, you participated in the selling of millions of dollars of medical supplies to the black market, that you were a thief, and worse, a traitor to humanity? Those would have been Wade's allegations. All those charges made against me were untrue. Anybody who knows me knows that they are lies. I didn't fear Holland Wade or his paper. Wouldn't Wade's allegations, indeed, wouldn't Wade himself have ruined your chance to become executive vice president of the South Wing Corporation, a position paying hundreds of thousands of dollars a year? Anybody would kill for reasons like that would have to be insane, Mr. Mason. There are many kinds of insanity, aren't there, General? Yes, they are. Do you recall an occasion during the Vietnam War when a man saved your life by killing with his bare hands? Isn't it true, General? that you and the Colonel McCauley were saved by a young Jeep driver, a black belt expert, who killed two of your attackers with his bare hands. Yes, that's right. What, General, is that heroic soldier's name? You're talking about my former aide of camp, my friend, Mr. James Rivers. Captain Rivers, you heard General Sorensen describe you as a friend. Isn't it true that after you saved his life, he recommended you for officer's candidate school? And after you were commissioned, he had you assigned to him? Yes, sir. And you resigned your commission how long after he retired? I believe it was the very next day. The next day? You really are devoted. 
Is that something I should be ashamed of, Mr. Mason? No, no. Now, Captain Rivers, would you please tell the court just where you were at the moment Harlan Wade was murdered? I would imagine I was driving General Sorensen and his wife home. No, Captain. You came to the party in your own car. The gate guard noted the license number, and if necessary, I can recall the general. No, no, I'm sorry, I forgot it's my fault. You see, I usually drive the general everywhere he goes. But this was a special occasion, wasn't it? You wanted to see Wade, and you wanted to see him alone. So you drove off, parked the car nearby, and then walked back. Isn't that so? No, Mr. Mason, that is not so. Tell me something, Captain Rivers. Isn't it true that you are an expert in unarmed defense? I suppose I am. And that if a man pulled a gun on you and was within your reach, it might be the last thing he ever did in this life? <laughs> I think that's uh, putting it a little strong. Is it? Why? Isn't that what really happened when you confronted Wade in the corridor of his house? He was surprised. He pulled his gun. Confronted by an angry man waving a gun, you reacted as you'd been trained to do. You killed him with a karate blow to the back of his neck. Harlan Wade's body was found in his own swimming pool. He was... He was dragged there, thrown into the water, after you discovered you'd killed him. This statue was just window dressing, wasn't it? You used it on his corpse to make it look like the murder weapon. Oh, you were lucky, weren't you? Lucky that the caterer's van was still on the estate. Lucky that there was an empty seat. Lucky that you could pose as just another temporary employee. Lucky to have gotten away undetected. Your Honor, this is pure speculation. Your Honor, may we have a moment? Yes, you may. Proceed, Mr. Mason. Captain Rivers. No. Now, you are way out of line, mister, and you can't prove any of this. I'm afraid I can. Captain Rivers, there's a bullet hole in the wall of the corridor where the murder took place. At my request this morning, the police removed a bullet from there. There are traces of fabric on it. Your Honor, all of this has absolutely nothing to do with me. Police at this moment are checking the jacket you wore to the party to see if those traces of fabric match it. Defense is prepared to prove that this bullet, uh, this bullet taken from the wall was fired from this gun, Harlan Wade's missing gun, the gun that you, Captain Rivers, ripped from him after he'd fired at you. There was a struggle, the gun was lost, but the barrel of this gun had your fingerprints on it. More than that, there is final proof that you killed Harlan Wade. A fresh bullet wound. Somewhere on your body, Captain Rivers, there is a fresh bullet well, thank you. All right. I did it. I killed him! No! I did it. I didn't mean to. But, sir, I don't regret it. And, yes, I waited for Wade that night in his house until after the party, because I was determined to get him off the general's back. I was determined. But before I could open my mouth, that man pulled a gun on me. Oh, let me, let me tell you about the wonderful Mr. Wade. 
That man, he feared and hated the whole world. And the world in return hated him, and rightfully so. That man was a disgrace to his profession, to our country, and most of all to humanity. And he set out to destroy one of our greatest patriots and one of our greatest soldiers. And the fight. The finest man that I have ever had the honor of knowing. And in the end, Harlan Wade destroyed himself. Justice. And as for you, Miss Bensie, all I could say is that if you're going to work for the devil, don't be surprised if you get burned. I'm sorry. Your Honor, the people move for a complete dismissal of all charges against the defendant. Case dismissed. Congratulations, Counselor. That was remarkable. Remarkable even for you. Well, a whole new start. Somewhere, I'm going to find a paper, I don't care how small, that will let me do my job the honest way. Harry, I'd like to thank you. Mr. Mason. On your way, both of you. All right. Goodbye, dear. At last, we're alone. <laughs> um, Harry. I know who sent me the flowers, the champagne, and the perfume. Who? You. Why would I do that? Because Tuesday was my birthday. You felt sorry for me, being here so many miles from home. I admit nothing. <laughs> if you remember, after I was 39, I stopped counting my birthdays. Really? What about the pearls, the amethyst ring, and all the other things? Well... Does that mean you're going to return them when you get to be 97? <laughs> again? Never. But I'm sure it was Fulman. You'd be willing to testify that if I managed to find him. Of course. But now I must go. Can't tell you how grateful I am you agreed to see me. It's beginning to think I was chasing a ghost. Unfortunately, he's very much alive. Au revoir, Captain Berman. Au revoir. Merci.
You know, you haven't heard a word I've said all night. Something about Cleveland? You're back in your Dita Krugman mode, aren't you? It's that obvious, huh? David, I know how badly you want to find Krugman. I mean, I know that's why you swung a transfer here. I know he did something terrible to your family. For God's sake, you've only been in Paris a few months, and the man's been missing for 45 years. You didn't expect it to be easy, did you? Of course not. Besides, but... you can't even be sure that Washington tip is valid in the first place. No, Krugman is alive, all right, and he's living somewhere here in Paris. That tip came straight from my friend at the OSI. Well, I've worked at the embassy for two years, and I don't know what that is. It's the Office of Special Investigations. They're the guys that track down Nazis living in the States. Anyhow, Elsa Ramsey was a Midanek survivor, and she saw Krugman here not more than a week ago. I never heard much about Midanek. Was it like Auschwitz? Uh, smaller, but yeah, just as bad. Anyhow, maybe this Elsa Ramsey made a mistake and it wasn't him. Then why was she murdered? Well, you don't know. She was. It could have been an accident. No, no. She spots Krugman, tells the Surete. I talked to her and 15 seconds later she's dead. That's no accident. Anyhow, I mean, I saw it. That car deliberately ran her down. Say you're right, that Krugman is here. Well, you keep after him, you could wind up splattered all over the street or something. I don't want that to happen. She saw her mother and father. My grandparents, you understand? She saw them taken to the gas chambers. And her two brothers murdered, I mean, right in front of her eyes. Krugman would have killed her, too, if he had the chance. As it is, he pretty well left her crippled for life. I'm sorry, I didn't know. In fact, she just had another operation on her legs. I couldn't tell you how many that makes. It's funny, when I was a little kid, I used to think my mother lived at the hospital and just came to our house to visit. But how do you possibly expect to find him? You don't even know what he looks like, right? No, no one's ever seen a picture of him, even from when he was young. So, all you have is a sort of a rough description from your mother, and she was what? 13 years old at the time? I know it is not going to be easy. If it was easy, they would have found him years ago. But I have to keep looking. I just, I just have to. Can't you understand that? Of course. I just don't want to see you overshadow everything else in your life. Like us, for instance. Captain Berman, please. You will join me in the van. What the hell are you talking about? I'm afraid I must insist. I assure you I mean you no harm. David, don't. Don't be afraid. Captain Berman will be returned home safely. Now, hurry, please. Okay, I think you better tell me what's going on. I must apologize to you for what may seem as cheap melodrama, but sometimes we are forced to take extreme measures. Yeah, who the hell is we? You do not need to know that. All you need to know, Captain, is that like you, for years we also have been searching for Dieter Krugman. And we believe now that he is here in Paris. Where is he? He goes by the name of Altman, Felix Altman, a successful businessman. Well, if you're so sure he's Krugman, why don't you go to the police? He's a wanted war criminal. Because, as yet, we lack sufficient evidence. All we have are rumors and one inconclusive photograph. A photograph? We believed we also had an eyewitness, the same one you had, Elsa Ramsey. Look, if uh, you and uh, who you work with, if you're so sure you've got Krugman, then why don't you just find another mighty next survivor that can make the identification? 
Because the death camp at Majdanek was just that, Captain. A death camp. Survivors were not the end product. That is why we need your help, Captain Berman. Me? We have sources at the police, at the Surete. They told us of your interest in Krugman. We investigated and learned that your mother is a Majdanek survivor. We would like you to bring her to Paris so she can make the identification. I don't know. When can I see that photograph? A rare picture. It has obviously changed in 45 years. Which is why we need your mother's testimony. Where can I see him? You can't see him at home or in his office. He refuses to see strangers. But we have learned that every Thursday morning he goes to a mineral spa outside the city. Where is this spa? It's called L'Eau de Dieu. It is near Barbizon. I'll go tomorrow. You have a car? I can borrow one. How do I contact you? We will contact you. And now you're free to go. Just as I promised the young lady. Major's a good guy. I just said I had some urgent personal business, and he gave me the day off. Oh, I still don't think you should go. I mean, if he is Krugman, then he's a very dangerous... Look, we and... talked that all out. I've got to go. I want to see what he looks like. That's all I want, really. You sure it's okay about the car? Yeah, as long as you don't go over 110. I'll have to pack my five. Maybe I should cop an urgent personal business plea, too, and go along with you. Well, I can probably get away, too. No, it's my problem. I'll deal with it. It's better I go along. Really. Here's the quickest way to get there. But make nice, huh? It's a classy joint. Come on, I'll show you where I parked the car. And you better get back to work. Don't worry. I'll be okay. Monsieur Rondo, oui, le 26, donc de 15h30 à 17h30. Parfait. Oui. Uh, Parlez anglais? Uh, yes, I do. I have a message for Mr. Felix Altman. If you go through that door and down the stairs, you will find Mr. Altman in room 8. that you want here. Out with it. It's not important. If you have something to say to me, then say it. I have nothing to say to you. I think you do. You want to talk about my Dinek? Leave us, please. Who are you? How did you get in here? It doesn't matter. Ah, but I think it does matter. No, what matters, Herr Krugman, Krugman? is what you did at Maidenek. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. My name is Altman. Felix Altman. Please, don't lie to me. I've seen your picture. You're <laughs> Dieter Krugman. Oh, man, you're a fool. <laughs> Ich 
appelle la police. It's been over three years, Perry. Not since Dan's funeral. I know, Helene, and I'm sorry. We've been too long apart. No. No apologies necessary. But too long friends for that. Besides, I never contacted you either. There's still no excuse. <laughs> Stan will always be my closest friend. He always said you were the one who got him through law school. No. No, in class, he always took the best notes. But you. How are you? Fine. They tell me I'll be out of here in a few days. Same old problem? Mm. Now it's my hip. All the pressure from the bad leg. All right, Elaine. Why did you call me? You remember our son, David. Of course I remember it. Well, now he's a captain with the Marines. He's attached to the American Embassy in Paris. Not a bad assignment. He's being charged with murder. Tell me. He's accused of killing Dieter Krugman. The Nazi? The one from Meidenek? The, uh, the one who did that? Could you help him, Perry? France has a different code of law. I don't, I don't even speak the language. He, he told me on the telephone, he thinks maybe he'll be turned over to the military or a court-martial. My associate will be on his way to Paris tomorrow morning. I'll join him day after. Oh, oh Perry, thank you. Thank you. First place, why did you go out there? Because after all these years, I, I had to see him in the flesh. I had to know if it was really him. And it was Dieter Krugman. His wife admitted it to the press. Besides, he pretty much looked like the picture. It's funny, I was expecting to see some sort of vicious monster. All there was was this pathetic old man. You don't know where the gun came from? I didn't even see it. I guess whoever shot him just tossed it on the floor. Could it have been the man who kidnapped you, the one in the van? David, we want to know the truth, all of it. Maybe in some kind of blind rage, you actually did kill him. No. You'd been hunting him for years. You'd been angry for years. You wanted revenge for years. Yes, but not that kind. Then what? I wanted to expose him to the world as as the kind of monster he was, so that nobody would ever forget. What do they say? Those who don't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Mr. Mason, my dad said that you were the best lawyer he ever knew. Will you do it? Will you represent me? You're entitled to military counsel. But I'd rather you handle it by yourself, if possible. Well, David, it's been a long time since my court-martial days. But I imagine it'll all come back. Mr. Mason. Lieutenant Fletcher, investigating officer for the court-martial. How do you do? This is my associate, Ken Milansky. We've met. Mm -hmm. There's a rumor, Mr. Mason, that you're going to represent Captain Berman before the court. More than a rumor, we are. In that case, it's something you should know. We sent the gun that was recovered at the murder scene to Washington for testing. It arrived back this morning. And it's definitely been identified as the weapon that fired the lethal round. I would have expected that. The serial number on the gun indicates it was the 9mm automatic issued to Captain David Berman the day he reported here for duty. Of course, 
Mr. Mason, I'll be glad to help, however I can. A thing like this reflects very badly on the entire consular service, even if it only involves a single Marine. You're talking about Moscow? Well, yes. And by the way, Mr. Mason, I must tell you that I have already been interviewed by Lieutenant Fletcher, and I'm afraid I had to tell him the truth. Good. The truth is that it was common knowledge within the embassy that Captain Berman had this obsession, you'd have to call it, about finding Krugman. Mr. Ambassador, thank you. Please send Mr. Mitchell in. Uh, here's some tangible help I can offer. Ah, Mr. Mitchell, come in, please. I want you to meet Mr. Perry Mason and Mr. Ken Melansky. They'll be representing Captain Berman at the court-martial. Gentlemen, this is Kurt Mitchell of our American Services Division. Good to meet you. Hi. Mr. Mitchell is a close friend of Captain Berman, and I'm assigning him to you while you're here. He can also arrange to get you some clerical help. You speak French and German, don't you, Kurt? Enough so that I'm not intimidated by the waiters, and enough to cut through a lot of bureaucratic red tape. Great. Since Della couldn't make the trip, Kurt can take her place. Della, I hope the change in gender won't be a problem. I think we can make the adjustment. But, yes, you can help us, Mr. Mitchell. Gladly, but please call me Kurt. All right, Kurt. Mr. Molansky has the names of some people we'd like to talk to. I need their addresses and their phone numbers. Is that people within the embassy? Oh, no. Potential witnesses. Altman's widow, the masseur at the spa... The family of that woman who was killed, Elsa Ramsey, and... Oh, yes, one person at the embassy, uh, Kathy? Kathy. Kathy Bramwell. I'll get right on it. Now, Mr. Mason, I will do whatever I can to facilitate your stay. But I, myself, must maintain a totally neutral position with regard to the guilt or innocence of Captain Berman. Uh, what I mean is... I can't interfere with the progress of the court-martial. We wouldn't want it any other way, Mr. Ambassador. This is Berman's apartment. Look at this door jam. Obviously forced open. By whom, Mr. Mason? After Captain Berman left, the murderer could have broken in, found the gun, and then proceeded David to the spa, where they waited for Berman to arrive and then killed Altman. Or Krugman, rather while Berman was still in the room with him. That's right. Or Captain Berman could have forced it to open himself. So it would look exactly the way you just theorized. <laughs> Again, you're right. After all, Captain Berman knew the gun would be traced back to him. Why go to all that trouble? Why not just get another gun? Because as a foreigner, it wouldn't have been easy for him to procure one. And besides, he didn't have the time. According to his own story, he only knew Krugman was going to be there the night before. Mr. Mason, I'm afraid all this just won't help your case very much. David's goal was to bring Krugman to justice, not to kill him. Well, maybe French justice wouldn't have been enough for him. As you probably know, France doesn't have capital punishment. Is everything all right? Not really. I have those uh, telephone numbers and addresses that you requested. Well, thank you. Now I need a copy of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. I'll have one sent over to your hotel, Mr. Mason. Well, Lieutenant... Thank you for all your help. No, ask anything you want. All right. All right. I know you were good friends with David's parents and all, but do you really think he didn't do it? I think he didn't do it. And as I told Lieutenant Fletcher, I think he never intended to do it. But he had a fixation and a great frustration about Krugman. Elaine told me all David ever talked about was trying to find Krugman, have him tried publicly in France, under the Crimes Against Humanity laws. Yeah, but why France? Why not some other country that has capital punishment? I mean, weren't most of the Maidenac survivors Poles and Germans? There were French nationals, too, like Elaine, like her whole family. That's right. So where do we start tomorrow? With the usual suspects. I'll start with Krugman's widow. You start with Kathy Bramwell. Yes, I've known for years my husband was Didier Krugman. How did you find out? Before we were married. 
I was helping him to move from his apartment. And by chance, I came across his identification card of Madnik. So he had to admit who he was. He swore to me he intended to tell me before we were married. He wanted no secrets between us. And then he, he burned the identification card. He warned me people would always be looking for him. Madame Altman, did you know the kind of man Dieter Krugman was? I knew the kind of man people thought he was. And still you married him. You did not know Felix, Mr. Mason. He was a kind and decent man. It is impossible to believe he was the monster people claim. Aside from people who were looking for Dieter Krugman, did he have any enemies? Uh, let me put it this way. Did Felix Altman have any enemies? All successful businessmen have enemies, Mr. Mason. Any who hated him enough to want him killed? Well, there is one. I don't want to say he could have done it, but he was very angry with my husband. Go on. His name is André Marchand. And your husband found out André Marchand had embezzled several million francs from the business and fired him. How did you know that? Are the police looking into this embezzlement? Yes, of course. Thank you very much for your time, Madame Altman. Mr. Mason, you do not believe the American soldier murdered Felix? No, I do not. Do you have any pictures of your husband? I have none. He was always afraid someone would see the photograph and recognize him as Krugman. He led a very fearful life, monsieur. We both did. I used to watch guys do that in New York. Are you Myron Fresh there? <laughs> Touche. Hey, how about that? Practically a native. Well, I guess we better get going. You probably have to be back at your desk. Anyway, you were saying you actually got the license plate number of that van? After I drove away with David, I wrote it down on a piece of paper. At least whatever I could remember. Then when he called me later and said everything was okay, I just forgot about it. Still have that piece of paper? In my pocket. I think it's important. Could it help David? It might. I remember there were a couple of sevens and a nine. I don't know. Anyhow, I'll get it for you. i tell you something else. I think I've seen that same van a couple of times since. Really? Where? When I went out shopping after work the other night. Then yesterday, I... My God. There it is. Los, schnell. Yes, I worked for Felix Altman for over 10 years. But this isn't one of his stores. It's mine. And it took all the money I made. Three million francs. 
That you were told I embezzled from Altman. You see, I know what they say. But you did not do that. For the past five years, Felix wanted to make me a partner in his business. Then, two months ago, he changed his mind. Just like that. So I merely paid myself a bonus. To the franc, exactly what I would have got if he had kept his promise. I consider it a fair settlement. Of course, he found out and fired you. Yes, but that was all her doing. Madame Altman? She made him change his mind about the partnership. Why? Because she is the most greedy and cold-hearted person I have ever met. In fact, it would not surprise me to learn that she was in some way responsible for her husband's death. She said the same about you. That does not surprise me. Do you know her history, monsieur? Well, I know she'd been a dancer in the Folie Bergère, and that she was much younger than her husband. When she became too old to appear naked on the stage, she seduced the old man into marriage. Why would she want him dead? Because lately the company had been losing money and she wanted him to sell out so she could keep all her precious capital. But he refused, so now she can keep the company. Oh, and collect the insurance. I see. Tell me, Marchand, did you have any idea Felix Altman was really Dieter Krugman? No. But he was always a very private, very secretive man. Meanwhile, you're facing a charge of embezzlement. Which I'm sure will be withdrawn once all the facts are known. Well, they'll certainly have a harder time proving their case now that their chief witness is dead. Monsieur, I believe I am through answering your questions. Perhaps you are. Perhaps not. Excuse the way the place looks. I wasn't expecting visitors. Uh, don't worry about it. Anyhow, I know exactly where I put it. Oh, my God. Maybe you weren't expecting visitors. You sure as hell had some. It's gone. The license number. They took it. Somebody is getting very proficient at breaking into apartments. It had to be the kidnapper. It would certainly look that way. Ferry thinks that your friends in the van weren't so friendly. That they might have set you up, framed you for Krugman's murder. Maybe, but whatever. I don't want you to involve Kathy anymore. She's already involved. She saw your kidnapper, and as far as they know, she saw their license numbers. Well, then you've got to protect her. We'll do everything we can. Hello, Della. Right on time. How are you? I'm just fine. How's it going over there? Still trying to sort our way through 45 years of history. Well, I suppose there's a worse place to do it. Oh, by the way, the district attorney is asking for a continuance on that Haskell case. Tell the DA it's fine with me. But did you reach the INS about Elsa Ramsey? That's what I'm really calling about. Elsa Ramsey was born in Poland, Elsa Brodsky. And later, during the war, she was in Majdanek. After that, she married a GI by the name of Arthur Ramsey. He brought her back to Ohio, to his hometown, and then later they had a baby girl named Marie. What happened to Ramsey? From all the information I can gather, he just dropped out of sight when the daughter was about 13. Where's the daughter now? She's living right there in Paris, working for a designer named Vicky Teal. Oh, that's interesting. Good work. All right, enough about business. How are you? Are you all right? All right? Why wouldn't I be? Well. You know when you're over there, you eat that rich food. Rich food? Here in Paris? Della, you're imagining things. 
Say hello for me. Ken sends his regards. Meanwhile, I'll check with you every day. Give you a cholesterol count. You're bad, Perry. Bad. Bad, bad, bad. Bye, Della. I would like you to talk to a woman named Marie Ramsey. She's Elsa Ramsey's daughter. She works for the fashion designer Vicky Teal. Find out if she has anything that might link the Krugman murder to her mother's murder. Look, I don't want to sound paranoid, but I really am worried about Kathy. If that van is following her... Don't worry, David. Two can play at that game. Um, you speak English? Probably better than I speak French. Oh. Yeah. Uh, what does a dress like this go for, anyway? 8,400 francs. Ugh. Wow, that's, uh, 1,200 bucks? Closer to 14. Your name Marie Ramsey? Mm-hmm. Mind if I ask you a few questions? About the dress? About your mother. Yes, I would mind. I don't like people who make me feel like a fool. Now, wait a second. I've never been to a place like this before. I was curious about the dress. But that's not why you came in here, is it? You came in to pry about my mother. Look, I'm a lawyer from the States. I work with another attorney named Perry Mason. We're representing David Berman, the Marine who's accused of killing Dieter Krugman. And you don't think he did it? No, we don't. That's why I'm here. Maybe you better explain that. All right. We're trying to find if there's a connection between your mother's death and Krug. He's the one who murdered her. What makes you think that? It had to be him. My mother didn't have an enemy in the world except for Dieter Krugman. And your mother thought she saw him two weeks ago on the street? She did see him. She went to the Sarate, but they said there was nothing they could do for her. But Berman had been making inquiries about Krugman, so I guess they told him and he contacted her. This is kind of personal. But after... After your father, after, after he... After he ran out on us? Why'd your mother bring you back here? Why not Poland? She couldn't face the memories. The nightmare. And she had friends here. Could you tell me about it? The nightmare? I'm afraid I have to get back to the showroom right now. I got all the time in the world. My mother was sent to Maidenek as forced labor, as a laundress. Maybe you don't know, but Maidenek wasn't like Auschwitz or Treblinka. Yeah, in what way? I mean, there was a death camp, but there was also an internment center attached to it. A concentration camp. That's where my mother worked. But Krugman was at the death camp. Yes, but because of my mother's duties, she had to go there to the other side. And Krugman was famous, if that's the word, even then. That's how she recognized him here. But how could she after 45 years? Well, she said he changed, but she could never forget his eyes. You looked into them and you actually saw the face of evil. Besides, she had a picture picture of her and a lot of the other might next staff including Krugman she said how ashamed she was being forced to pose for those animals but she kept it because she never wanted to forget how bad life could get uh, look Miss Ramsey uh, is it possible I could see that picture you were talking about I've never seen it myself and I've stored my mother's things yeah it might be important I'd have to go through the boxes tonight or in the morning. Come on, I, I'd really appreciate it. All right. I'll come by and pick it up tomorrow. Hello? If I find it, why don't I just send it to your hotel? Molanski? No. Um, wait a second. That's me. 
Your name's Melansky? Melansky, Borofsky. Maybe we're even related. Hello? Yeah, Perry. No kidding. Where? Okay, I'm on my way. I'll see you tomorrow. You sure must have a lot of pull with the ambassador to get me all this time off. He's being very cooperative. Anyhow, I'm so glad you're representing David. I just wish I could be of more help. If only I could remember that stupid license number. It may not be important, Kathy. But it is. This is far enough. What's far enough? Are you certain you could recognize David's kidnapper if you saw him again? Oh, sure. I mean, it was only a few seconds, but I'd know him anywhere. Look over there. It's a van. Why don't you give me the keys? No. You see over there, the gendarme? Ah. He's been following us since we started our little walk. Well, what can we do? What we can do has been done. Let's go. That's him. That's the man who took David. What do you want? Who are you? Who do you work for? I cannot tell you that. Then perhaps you would like to tell those gendarmes over there why you engage in kidnapping and murder. We do not murder. Ken, ask some of those fellows over there to step over here, will you? Sure. No. Wait. What is it you want? I want to know who you are and what you're after and who you work for. It will take a moment. You have just one. Now, come and see me a bit. I've been here with David Berman's Werksanwalt. Er droht ihnen mit der Polizei, wenn er sie nichts sprechen darf. Also dann. You'll be at the Trocadero at 6.45 tonight. A car will pick you up and you will come alone. I want some identification from you. A passport, driver's license. I'll return it tonight. Carl Meyerhoff. Well, Carl Meyerhoff, if that car doesn't arrive at 6.45, the Surete will be looking for you. The car will be there. Give him back the keys. I like it. You're taking a big chance. I'm sure before this is over, you'll both be taking a big chance. So you asked the Surete about Meyerhoff? Yes, but so far nothing. And I'm checking up on Daniel Altman and Andre Marchand. Oh, and I have a list of the court martial brass, most of them coming in from Brussels, from NATO. That car should be here. I still don't think you should go. Not alone. I agree. You don't know these people. How about Kurt and I follow behind in my car? No, if they spot you, they'll call it off. We can't take that chance. This might be it. You have a pen? Here's the number Meyerhoff punched in on his mobile phone. If I'm not back in two hours, give it to the Sorte. My orders are that you come alone. My friends just came to see me off. I can't make out the plates. He usually does, but tonight. 
I don't know. Chair for our guest. Uh, no, I, I won't stay very long. You, you wanted to see me, Mr. Mason. I don't know your name. Otto Rossen. That still doesn't tell me very much. Mr. Mason, have you ever heard of the Treblinka uprising in 1943? Yes. Almost 60 prisoners escaped the death camp. And I was one of them. I lived in the woods like an animal for six months. During this time, I made a promise to God and to myself that if I survived, I would spend the rest of my life tracking down the Nazi barbarians who visited their unspeakable horrors against the world. That's what you do now? For 44 years, I've been a hunter. I worked behind the scenes with your own OSI in Washington, with my friend Simon Wiesenthal, and with others all over the world. Weisenthal and the others work out in the open, with the public. As did I, Mr. Mason, until a few years ago when our offices in West Berlin were firebombed and three of our people died. We've been obliged to go undercover since we came here in search of Krugman. I represent David Berman, charged with the murder of Dieter Krugman. I'm looking for the person who committed that murder. <laughs> you imagine it might be me or someone who works with me? Well, now that I know who you are, that conclusion doesn't seem unreasonable. And why should we want to kill Dieter Krugman? Because he's your prey, and France does not have the death penalty. Ah, but you miss two important points. First, we could have easily have arranged for Krugman to be transported to a country where there is the death penalty. He committed crimes against the humanity of many nations. In truth, we regret that Krugman is dead. If he'd been captured and put on trial, the impact on the public would have been immeasurably more powerful. And Mr. Mason, the public, the world, must never be allowed to forget. But I still don't know why you have to go in for so much cloak and dagger, so much secrecy. Because, as I told you, we had to go underground. And because Odessa has a price on my head. A very, <laughs> very flattering amount, I must admit. You've heard of Odessa, Mr. Mason? A network of ex-Nazis and Nazi sympathizers. Many people assume that Odessa is only fiction. But unfortunately, it's all too real. And its tentacles are everywhere. So this cloak and dagger you refer to is our means of preserving our security. <laughs> I'd like to see the picture of Krugman that was shown to Captain Berman. I thought you'd ask. Carl? Many of these butchers had very little trouble establishing new identities after the war. May I keep this? Of course. I know your reputation. And if Captain Berman is innocent, he has nothing to fear. I shall have you driven back to your hotel. Good night, Mr. Mason. Good night, Mr. Rosen. Hey, good morning. Bonjour. Oh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's really beautiful. Look, you don't have to keep pretending. I'm not pretending. I like it. This is the only thing you really came to see.
My mother's the one on the right. Which one's Krugman? She didn't say. She never talked about it. Too painful, she said. Anyhow, you keep it as long as you need it, but I'd like it back. Do you have any plans for dinner tonight? You don't need to do that. I know I don't. But I'm a stranger in town, and I don't speak the language. And I thought it would be nice to have dinner with a fellow American, especially such a beautiful one. I don't think that's such a good idea. Besides, I'm not American. I've spent more time here than in the States. I pretty well think of myself as French. Well, then do it in the name of closer U.S.-French relations. Think of uh, Gene Kelly and Leslie Caron. OK. Dinner. But no dancing through any fountains. <laughs> Darn. I'll call you later. We sure got here a lot faster than I did the other day. I just wish I hadn't come in the first place. Let's go. They're expecting us. And I was standing right here, and the shot sounded like it came from right behind me. Next thing I knew, they grabbed me, and that's all I really know. So... Somebody could have fired from the back of that door and escaped unseen. Everybody who came in after that shot came through that door. Where does this door lead? To a storage room. Does it have an outside entrance? Hey. Well, that's one theory, Mr. Mason. But it's a bit hypothetical to prevent the court martial. Lieutenant, you were right about that today, but today is not tomorrow. The court is called for 10 a.m. Let's go. What about the fingerprints on the gun? What about them? There were no fingerprints, you know that. But doesn't that work for David? Not really. Prosecution could argue how this cold and calculating defendant carefully wiped his fingerprints from the gun as his victim lay dead at his feet. Then what does that leave us with? I mean, if David didn't do it, then who did? You tell me. Daniel Altman, for the money? It's possible. We should check that insurance out. I've got some stuff on her coming in the morning. Andre Marchand? Mm -hmm. Another possible. Kurt, see if the Surete can verify his whereabouts the day of the murder. OK. But my source says he may have some other important information on Marchand. What about Meyerhoff or this Otto Rosen? No. After what you told me, they're off the list. Who else? I got no idea. Maybe somebody we don't know of yet. Maybe another Maidenak survivor. There is another possibility. Who? Compare that photo with the one you got from Marie Ramsey. This one's from Rosen? Yep. the same face. So... Elsa Ramsey did recognize Krugman on the street and was probably killed for it. So who is this other suspect? If uh, your mother were murdered, wouldn't you want vengeance on whoever did it? By the way, Ken, how did your dinner go this evening? Perry. There's no way she could have done it. Probably not. When you return that photo, do a little digging. Whatever you say. But I can't even imagine her being involved. Nor could I. Gentlemen, the court martial starts at 10 a.m. in the morning. We'd like to speak to Madame Altman. I'm sorry. Madame Altman is in conference. And can I be discussed? You can see that we uh, have an appointment, will you? No problem. Just a moment, monsieur. You can go in there. Actually, it's very easy. I've been here before. Remember? Uh, you'd better stay, Marchand. I'm glad to find the two of you together. It saves me a visit. What do you want? 
I thought we'd share some information. We're not interested. I certainly was. You see, the Surete has no report of any embezzlement by Marchand. I suspect there wasn't any. I think you'd better go now. What happened was your husband discovered that you and Marchand had been having an affair. You don't know what you're talking about. So he fired you and threatened to divorce you. If you do not go now, I will call the security. He was ashamed to let anyone around him know how he'd been betrayed, so he concocted the cover story of an embezzlement. After he was dead, it suited your purpose to let the story stand. When we talked, each of you pointed an accusing finger at the other to disguise the fact that you were lovers. Why would we do that? So nobody would guess you had a definite motive to kill your husband? And what would that be? Get him out of the way before he could divorce you. So you'd inherit whatever estate he had left, plus whatever insurance there was. The two of you would live happily ever after. It's lies, a pack of lies. Andre, please, be quiet. Mr. Mason, some of what you say is true. We are lovers. But we had nothing to do with the killing of my husband. I swear it to you. You may have to. In front of a court-martial that starts in half an hour. Bonjour. Yes, sir. As soon as the local surete was given proof that Captain Berman carried a diplomatic passport, both he and the gun found at the scene were turned over to me. And you had the gun sent on to Washington? Yes, sir, to Corps headquarters, along with the bullet taken from the deceased body. They forwarded both items to the Department of Defense, where Marine Intelligence made ballistics tests. Excuse me, Mr. President. Defense is willing to stipulate that the gun found at the murder scene was the same weapon that fired the fatal bullet. Thank you, Counselor. In that case, I have no further questions for Lieutenant Fletcher. No questions. Thank you, Lieutenant Fletcher. You may step down. Please call your next witness. Master Sergeant Frederick Hansen. The serial number on the 9mm automatic that Lieutenant Fletcher gave me corresponded to the serial number on the gun that I myself issued to Captain Berman on the 6th of August of this year. The date he reported for duty at the embassy here? You're sure? I keep very careful records, sir. As a matter of fact, I brought them with me if you'd like to show them to the court. Defense will stipulate the gun that killed the deceased was the same gun issued to the defendant. Thank you, Mr. Mason. No questions, sir. No questions. Thank you, Sergeant Hanson. Colonel Calvelli, you may call your next witness. Sir, I'm afraid he isn't here yet. I didn't expect all these stipulations from the defense, and I told him 11 o'clock. Well... In that case, we'll call a short recess. Court will resume at 11.30. Colonel Calvelli, you will inform us if there are any additional schedule problems? Of course, sir. Is that good? It never hurts to rattle the other side a little. We could use a little more time. Good news, Mr. Mason. At least I think it is. There was a 10 million franc insurance policy on Altman's life, and Danielle Altman is the sole beneficiary. Interesting. But that still only goes to motive. We need a lot more. I have things to do. Lieutenant Fletcher, why don't we all get a cup of coffee? Well, Mr. Ambassador, sit down. Mr. Mason? Things don't seem to be going well. I'd like to ask you for a little help. Certainly. Perhaps someone in the State Department could contact the Soviet Procurator General's office in Moscow. The Soviets? What for? The Russians liberated Maidanek in 45, and they'd still have all the records. I'd like to see everything they have on Dieter Krugman. You really think they'll cooperate? Yes, I do. But I'd appreciate it if you'd keep your inquiry as private as possible. I'll do what I can, but why do you need their files on Krugman? Well, 
So far, I have a lot of questions and very few answers. Maybe the Soviets can supply some. Or maybe not. Yes, he seemed very intense. Very, I say it, menacing. Objection. Calls for a conclusion. Move to strike. Sustained. The witness's answer will be stricken. What exactly did Captain Berman say? He said he wanted to talk to Monsieur Altman about... My Danek, is it? Mm -hmm. Then I left the room. But after I shut the door, I could still hear voices. Angry voices. Then what happened? Didier and I... Didier is the receptionist. We heard the shot, and we ran back to the room. We saw the Americans staring down at Monsieur Altman's body. Did you see the gun? Yes, it was on the floor. Not far from the body. And this American that you saw, is he here in this courtroom today? Well, he's seated right over there. Indicating the defendant, Captain Berman. Sir, no further questions. Monsieur Dario, would you tell us if there's another door to that room other than the one leading to the hallway? Yes, it leads to a room that's used for storage. And from there, there is a door leading to the outside. What? So, it's entirely possible that some other person could have hidden behind that door, shot Monsieur Altman, and then escaped without being seen. It is possible, I suppose, but I didn't see any such person. Thank you, Monsieur Dario. And neither did anyone else. I move that last remark be stricken. The court will please disregard the witness's unsolicited response. No, it's not going too well. But we haven't been up the bat yet. So will you be going right back to the States after the trial? I don't know. Why? Just thought since you were here, you might take some vacation time. Uh, I doubt it. Too many cases pending back home. How about you? How about me what? Oh, you think you'll come back? To the States? Why would I? Well, it was your mother's idea to come here, and, uh, well, you know. I told you, this is my home now. But, uh, what if you were to get involved with some American where is it written that a woman has to follow a man? I mean, if a man truly cared, couldn't he think about relocating here? Makes sense, I guess. <laughs> Look, there's something I gotta ask you. That sounds a little ominous. Not really. After your mother died, did you ever try to find Krugman yourself? Why do you want to know? No reason. I mean, it just seems like it would be kind of a natural instinct to want to find Krugman, bring him to justice. Is that what this is all about? You really want to cross-examine me, accuse me of murder? Marie, wait a second. No, you know what you are, you know what your problem is? You're a fake. You just don't say what you want. You always have to enter into some stupid little game. Marie, now, wait just a just second. Just give me my picture back and leave me alone.
don't understand is why anybody would want that picture so badly. Don't worry about it. The security people at the embassy made me copies yesterday. Good. Give one to Marie. Hello? Yeah, hold on. It's Ambassador Todd. Hold on a minute. Mr. Ambassador? Good. Yes, I hope so, too. And Mr. Ambassador, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> the Russians are cooperating. We should be getting their Krugman file by courier sometime around noon tomorrow. I hope it helps. France may not have the death penalty, but a U.S. court-martial does. Well, I, I, I don't know that I'd call it an obsession. What would you call it? Objection. What she would call it is irrelevant. Sustained. But he arranged to have himself transferred to Paris, made repeated inquiries about Krugman at the Surete, even met with a woman who claimed that she could identify him. Now, surely that was more than just idle curiosity. Objection. Witness is not a psychiatrist. Sustained. Miss Bramwell, isn't it true that the defendant often said that no matter what, he had to find Dieter Krugman? Objection irrelevant and calls for hearsay. No. It goes to state of mind and motive. Overruled, Mr. Mason. You may answer the question, Miss Bramwell. Yes. That's what he said. No more questions. Miss Bramwell, what did David tell you was his ultimate objective when he found Krugman. Objection. No foundation or relevancy. Oh, Mr. President, it was Colonel Calvelli's inquiries that opened the door to this subject. Overruled. The witness may answer the question. He wanted a public trial so everyone in the world would know what Krugman did. Did he ever say one word, one word, about wanting to kill the man? No. Looks like the prosecution will wrap things up this afternoon. Have improved their case. Motive, weapon, opportunity. Here it is, Mr. Mason. Moscow. Our decoding people made a translation for you. Ken. Bring David to the conference room. Does that help? Maybe the break we've been looking for, but I need more help from you. You know my ground rules. No, 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 believe me. Nothing will compromise your neutrality. I want serious cooperation from the local Surete. Well, Mr. Mitchell's been in touch with them. I'm sure he can No, help. no, I, I don't think Kurt can handle this. For what I have in mind, the request has to come from the highest level. Besides, there's a question of time. Well, tell me exactly what you want to do what I can. David, I want your consent to bring your mother here to testify. Well, what for? I mean, you saw her. She's just getting over surgery. I know. We'll make sure she's well taken care of. But what can she do? For starters, she just might save your life. What are you talking about? Who's this? According to the Russians, that's a picture of Dieter Krugman. No, it isn't. Why not? You've seen the picture of Krugman. This isn't the same man. Maybe he had plastic surgery. A lot of those guys did. That is Krugman, right? Yes. Both photos show a man in SS uniform. Now, why would he have had plastic surgery before the war ended? Okay, you're right, he wouldn't. But it doesn't make sense. That's why I need your mother here, to explain the discrepancy. She's very fragile, Mr. Mason. She's always been. She survived Maidenek. 
Okay. Yes, I, I talked to the doctor and he said it's all right for her to travel. But, matter of fact, I think even if he'd said no, she would have come. That sounds like Helene, all right. When you talk to her, tell her Ken will meet her at the plane and she'll be staying at the Royal Monceau with us. Right, right. Uh, I think you should know, though, Perry. Even with her faith in you, she's still very worried. Well, she's not the only one. But don't tell her that. Perry. Bye, Della. As you heard, I want you to meet Elaine. I booked her on flight 1110, arriving early at noon. Please bring her directly to the embassy. What about the court-martial? Oh, Colonel Butler's giving us a one-day delay. Well, that's good. Good. Elaine's testimony could be the key to this whole case. You feel is a gun, and I will use it if you do not do as I say. Come on, let's go. You have friends arriving here, Meyerhoff? David, is that the man? Yeah, that's him. Sir, you're under arrest. See you tomorrow. Don't turn out. Mr. Mason. second, I thought everything got fouled up. Now what? We just let French justice take its course, head back to the hotel. Back to the hotel? What for? David's mother arrived two hours ago on the Concorde. Kathy's with her. train for three days. My mother and father, my two brothers and me, and probably 70 others in one box car, and no food or water the last day and a half. How old were you? Fifteen. My brothers were 14 and 17. Please go on. Finally, at dawn of the fourth day, the train stopped at Maidenek. They forced us to jump off the train. And I saw my mother and father shoved into a group of people and marched away. There were no goodbyes. I learned later they were taken directly to the gas chambers. Then my brothers and I, along with many other children our ages, were marched to some kind of a holding area. My brother Jean went up to this SS man and demanded to know where they had taken our parents. He did not answer, but he, he just raised this iron pipe he carried and smashed Jean to the ground with it. Then my other brother Alan ran to the man and he also was smashed to the ground. Then, then he kept hitting him until he was dead. Somehow, Jean managed to get to his feet and he, he went after the man, tried to knock him down. 
But the man raised the iron bar to hit Sean again. I grabbed this piece of glass and I ran at him. And I grabbed his hand and cut it as hard as I could. He screamed and shook me away. And then he brought the iron bar down on my knee. Then he went back to Jean and finished his killing. Then he raised the bar over my head. He would have killed me too, but another SS officer arrived and ordered him to move all of us immediately to the work barracks. He called the man with the pipe, Krugman. Opt Sturmführer Krugman. I never saw him again. But I will remember his face until the day I die. Thank you, Miss Berman. I apologize for obliging you to relive that day. Now, I would like you to look at some photographs, if you will. Of course. These are photographs, Mr. President, already admitted into evidence. They are identified in your packets as A, B, and C. Mr. Prosecutor, do you have yours? Mr. Malansky, photograph A, please. Now, do you recognize that man? Yes, I recognize him. Could you tell us the name of that man? I do not know it, but it is the SS officer who came and ordered Krugman to take us away. He did not mean to, I'm sure, but he saved my life. But the man in that photograph is not Dieter Krugman. No. Photograph B, please. Now, do you recognize the same man in that photograph? Yes, that's him, right there. That man was known as Altman, Mrs. Berman. Felix Altman. But he is here, too. Who is there? Krugman. Right there. Photograph C, please, the Russian photo. And that man, that is also Dieter Krugman? Yes. Yes, that is the monster. That's Krugman. I'm sorry, Mrs. Berman. I'm sorry. I have no more questions of this witness. Colonel Calvelli? No questions, sir. That's all, madam. We thank you for helping us here today. And we'll take a 10 minute recess. Captain Berman, you have permission to assist your mother. Yes, my husband's business was failing. What did he do about that? He was désespéré. He went to everyone he knew to borrow money. To find some money to keep the business going. Did he succeed? No. Madame Altman, I have a few more questions. But I must remind you that you are still under oath. Oui, I know. Madame, what was your husband's real name? Felix Meinheim. But he changed it to Altman. He did not want anyone to know he'd been stationed at Madnik. Then why did you lie? Why did you tell the authorities and the press after he died that your husband was really Dieter Krugman? Because someone threatened to kill me. And since Felix had been murdered, I did believe they would try to kill me too. Who, oh, Madame Altman? 
Who threatened to kill you? A man named Carl Meyerhoff. What is your relationship to Otto Rosen? I work for him. And on his orders, did you kidnap David Berman? Yes. On his orders, did you follow and electronically eavesdrop on Miss Catherine Bramwell? Yes. On his orders, did you threaten Danielle Altman's life? Yes, but of course I would not have done it. On his orders, did you kill Elsa Ramsey? No, I've never killed anybody. I see. Tell me, Mr. Meyerhoff, why were you waiting for Helene Berman at the airport yesterday? All Rosen told me was that he wanted to talk to her before she appeared at this trial. So you were just going to spirit her off. And Rosen was just going to talk to her. That's what he said. Mr. Meyerhoff, did you know that Felix Altman was not Dieter Krugman? I only knew what Rosen told me. Did you kill Felix Altman? No. Do you know who did? No, but it wasn't me. I wasn't even in Paris that day. You can verify that. I already have. No further questions. Colonel Calvelli? No questions, sir. Defense calls Otto Rosen. Mr. Rosen, you do understand that your friend Meyerhoff has just testified. Uh, yes. When your friend Meyerhoff called you to set up our meeting, I noted the number he punched on his mobile phone. I called that number the next day, found it was the office of a very prestigious brokerage house here in Paris. Really? Uh, perhaps you made a mistake with the number, huh? Mr. Rosen, when we met, I asked why you were working underground. You gave me several answers, none of which I found satisfactory. I did some research. I found there'd been no bombing of any office in West Berlin three years ago, and that Mr. Wiesenthal had never heard of an Otto Rosen. Then came the question of identities. I'm grateful to the Russians for helping me sort it all out. Perhaps you will not be. I have no idea what you're talking about. Neither do I, Mr. President, and I must object to this whole line of inquiry as irrelevant. Irrelevant? Mr. President, the testimony of this witness is the essential part of our defense. And evidently, the defense is based on blue sky instead of on hard evidence. Mr. President, again, this is all irrelevant to the defendant's guilt or innocence. I assure the court, even the skeptical colonel, that the relevancy will quickly become apparent. Overall. Mr. Rosen, I submit that the office where we met was a total fake. A piece of theater you designed to convince me that you were a Jew and a Nazi hunter. Well, why? I submit, Herr Rosen, that you were and are neither. Why should you say that? I'm Otto Rosen, and I have been a Nazi hunter for 44 years. I submit, Herr Rosen, that your real name is Krugman. Dieter Krugman. Dieter Krugman? You're insane. I'm Otto Rosen. Mr. President, I beg this court's indulgence. I wish to bring into this interrogation at this time a witness, an expert witness, purely for the purposes of identification. Go ahead, Mr. Mason. Mr. Molansky. Otto Rosen. Dieter Krugman. I submit it was you who ordered Felix Altman killed and had his wife threatened. That is a terrible lie. You and Altman knew each other. You knew each other was here in Paris, both successful businessmen. You felt safe, didn't you? 
for one to betray the other, he would have to betray himself. But when Altman's business began to collapse, he became desperate. He came to you. He demanded money. Demanded money or he'd reveal your true identity. For Felix Altman, that was suicide. Yeah, it's an interesting theory, Mr. Mason, but a pity you have no proof for such wild charges. <laughs> I call the court's attention to the file from Russia, entered as Defense Exhibit 3. You will note the description of Dieter Krugman. It includes the fact that he has a scar across the back of his right hand. Now, Mr. Rosen, I would like you to show the court your right hand. You've no right to ask me anything. I'm a French citizen. Show the court your right hand. Turn it over. I wonder if that scar could have been made by a jagged piece of glass in the hands of a little girl some 45 years ago. Now, would you please remove your glasses? Remove your glasses. Mrs. Berman, do you recognize that man? Yes. The eyes of the devil. Krugman. I have no further questions of the witness. I have no questions, sir. I'm going to excuse this witness and suggest the Surete take him into immediate custody. Mr. President, in view of the fact that the prosecution has made a prima facie case against the defendant, that insufficient evidence has been produced to contradict any element of that case, I move for a directed verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree. I ask the court to defer ruling on that motion until after the testimony of my final witness. Mr. President, defense counsel continues to play his excruciating little delaying game, tantalizing us with this whole parade of mysterious witnesses, none of whom have disproved in the slightest the case against the defendant. Uh, Mr. President, this case is much more complicated than Colonel Calvelli seems able to comprehend, certainly more complicated than any of us would wish. The charge against the defendant is very serious. I believe the court should give us every reasonable opportunity to prove his innocence. Mr. Mason, Colonel Calvelli's motion is somewhat irregular, but the point is well taken. If defense has some strong evidence to present us soon, let's hear it. Yes, sir. Call your next witness. Isn't it true, Mr. Mitchell, that although Ambassador Todd assigned you to work with Mr. Melansky and myself, it was you who asked for the assignment? Yes, of course I did. David's a good friend of mine. And you? Are you a good friend of David's? Excuse me? I can't excuse you. You know, a lot of things bothered me about this case. For instance, how did Meyerhoff know the defendant was going out to dinner the night he was kidnapped? How did the photo thief know Mr. Melansky was going to return the picture to Miss Ramsey that day? And how did Elsa Ramsey's killer know she had recognized Krugman on the street? According to her daughter, the only people she talked to were the Surete and the defendant. Suddenly, a great light hit me. You. You were the only one who knew all these things. 
because as David's friend, he confided in you. To be sure you were the contact, I let you make the travel arrangements for David's mother. Sure enough, there was Carl Meyerhoff waiting for her at the airport. The right time, the right gate. You're way off base, Mr. Mason. I had nothing to do with Rosen or Krugman or whatever his name is. How long have you been in Paris, Mr. Mitchell? Eleven years. Why? Eleven years. You recognize this? It looks like a paper napkin. And on it is your handwriting, is it not? I suppose so. Suppose? Is it your handwriting or is it not? It is. Those are the directions you wrote down for the defendant the day he drove out to the spa to see Felix Hoffman. So? So, you've lived in Paris for 11 years. And yet you give your friend directions that will take him at least 20 minutes longer than necessary. That's not true. Not true? Not true, Mr. Mitchell. All right, maybe I made a mistake. No mistake. You gave David Berman faulty directions. You gave yourself time to get to his apartment. Steal his gun, proceed him to the spa, and lie in wait to kill Felix Altman. What possible reason would I have to kill Altman? Mr. Mitchell... On your personnel records, you're listed as the son of Wilhelm and Gisela Mitchell, married in Milwaukee in 1956. Gisela, maiden name Krauss, immigrated to the United States in 1954. But your age here is listed as 37. That means that you're not the actual son of Wilhelm Mitchell but a child of Gisela's from a former marriage. I would like to introduce into evidence a certified copy of a birth certificate obtained from the West German government. It lists the birth of one Kurt Johann Krugman, son of Gisela Krauss Krugman and Hans Krugman. In other words, Mr. Mitchell, you are the blood nephew of Dieter Krugman and a member of Odessa. That is a lie. That is a lie. Ein Mitglied von Odessa. Ja! Ich bin ein Krugmann. Und ich bin ein Top-Mitglied von Odessa. Und Sie werden sterben. You will die. Sergeant. Yes, sir. I move for a directed verdict of not guilty. Motion granted. The defendant is free to go. You. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank heaven. You're going to have to stick around a few days to fill in those blanks for the Surete. No problem. You ready? My bags are already in the taxi. I'll get mine. What are you talking about? Business. I have to go. Well, what about... I, I mean... Hell, this isn't fair. Well, I might still be there when you get back. Marie, if you think I'm going to let you get away without kissing your goodbye, you're crazy. 